A very warm welcome to Reflections. This is our uh, devotional Bible study in which we're presently in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, Ecclesiastes reminds us of what Jesus said in John 10.10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full, to have a full abundant life. And Solomon in the Old Testament gives us some wisdom for you and I in the 21st century. But of course, we see everything in Scripture with uh, eyes through Christ. I will be in chapter 7. If you have a Bible and would like to follow along, feel free to do that. We're going to begin today with that great hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. truth on this side of heaven in knowing that our Redeemer lives. He uh, silences all our fears, wipes away our tears, calms our troubled heart, has blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And so once again, we're blessed as we're able to hear God's word. So we pick it up uh, in various verses from chapter 7 of the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll read verse 1 and 2, jump down to verse 8 and 10, and, and kind of skip around a little bit uh, to, to reflect on some of the uh, scriptures we'll look at today. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go out to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man the living should take this to heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. And do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When things are good, be happy. And when times are bad, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. A righteous man perishing in his righteousness and a wicked man living long in his wickedness. Wisdom makes one wise, a, a wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. All these things I have tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever wisdom may be, it is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? 
So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. And the last verse of the chapter, this only have I found, God made mankind upright, but men have gone in search of many schemes. I was reminded of an angel that appeared to some religious leaders to for them that God was going to reward their leader. He, his behavior was exemplary, and God, the angel said God would grant, like Solomon, infinite wealth, wisdom, or beauty. But without hesitating, the leader selects infinite wisdom. Done, says the angel, and disappears in a cloud of smoke and a bolt of lightning. Now all heads turn toward the leader, and he has this faint halo of light surrounding him. Someone whispered, say something, say something, say something. The leader sighs and says, I should have taken the money. No, we need wisdom for abundant living as, as we live under the, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, a better way because of the cross and resurrection. Well, we come today to the halfway mark in Ecclesiastes. He begins to give wise counsel. Interesting, the words wise and wisdom appear almost 35 times in the rest of the book. This uh, chapter looks a lot like Solomon's book of Proverbs. There's different Proverbs, of course, that Solomon wrote. For example, there's Proverbs that say something like, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So there's a connecting word, but. Gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh word stirs up anger. Other types of Proverbs use the word and. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain, and in the end of joy may be grief. So you saw the connector word and there. Well, the connector word that Solomon uses today was better than. So better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil. So he will use better in this chapter. Today and next week, this is part one, and next week will be part two of wise advice to have a blessed life. So he begins, a good name is better than good oil. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting because that is the end of every person, the living takes it to heart. Now, as we look at this through the eyes of Christ, those who have the assurance of the re resurrection have hope and they get the most out of life. Now, there's a connection between the brevity of life and the beauty of life. You now, thinking about our death and being prepared for it invites us to become people of depth. So he uses the word oil here. It's better translated perfume. Oil that had a sweet smell was precious. A good name speaks of influence and character. Maybe you remember the old Zenith commercial. The quality goes in before the name goes on. A wise pastor once said, Consider it spiritually, dear brethren. What is a good name? A good name is written in the Lamb's book of life, better than the sweetness of all ointments. And for you and I, who have the assurance of the resurrection and the hope that the cross and resurrection bring to our life, that mentality throws our culture a curve. You see, our culture prefers birthday parties over a funeral. You know, visiting a funeral parlor, parlor sometimes is better than gorging oneself at a banquet. 
I find it interesting some of the old Romish monks read their Bibles with a candlestick in the skull. I remember when I was pastoring a, a church in Illinois, I went on vacation and I came back and there was a skeleton in my office. The youth director uh, formed a little prank. I think we were gone a couple weeks. I think he was saying, you've been gone too long. Uh, I'm glad you're back. Well, hopefully that's what he was saying. Paul said in Philippians, I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better Yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. The joy of eternity is better than anything on this side of heaven. Now, you know, I don't know about, you know, we're certainly to enjoy the blessings of life. And I would, I, I always like to say every blessing that we have on this side of heaven is a foretaste of a greater feast to come. So when I'm on the golf course and get a, an eagle, which is very rare, by the way, is kind of a foretaste of the greater feast to come. Now, if I got a hole in one, that would even be better. I have not done that yet other than in putt-putt. But uh, obviously get an eagle or a hole in one on this side of heaven is certainly pretty special. I was reminded of a, a man in his five-year-old son were driving past a cemetery. The little boy noticed a large pile of dirt next to a freshly dug grave. He said, look, Dad, one got out. Well, next time we're reminded of death or we think of a loved one who's with the Lord, we go back to Jesus, the one whom the grave could not hold. And that was brought out very powerfully in the hymn. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. And that is the hope and the power of the resurrection. A mother was explaining to her little girl the, the death of her father. The mother said, God has sent for your father and will send for us, but I don't know just when. The little girl said, if we don't know just when God is going to send for us, don't you think we had better pack up and get ready to go? God might send for us when we're not ready. That is a little girl who's thinking about the resurrection. A young girl of 15 was completely paralyzed on one side and nearly blind. She heard the family doctor say to her parents, I'm sorry she's seen her best days, poor child. But the 15-year-old heard and said, No, doctor, my best days are yet to come when I shall see the king in his beauty. The, yes, the assurance of the resurrection is what gives us hope. Nothing else can take its place on this side of heaven. Then Solomon challenges us to cultivate a Christ-like character. He goes on to say, Patience of spirit is better than Arrogance of spirit. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? Consider the work of God who is able to straighten what he has bent. On the day of prosperity, be happy. But on the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. So again, Solomon is saying to us in, in the eyes of new covenant, the better way, the challenges and difficulties of life develop in us a Christ-like character, and we shouldn't underestimate those in our life. God allows the ups and downs of life to stabilize our dependence on him. So a humble person will be patient because they trust that God is working on the inside. And he, what's, he works on the inside, he desires for us to let, let out and shine so that others may see. A pastor daughter said, you know, daddy, in every respect, you're the most spiritual man I know until you get behind the wheel. Hey, we're all under construction, especially pastors and chaplains. Pride says be discontent with the present because our past is better than today or tomorrow. 
Pride leads to a negative outlook, but patience leads to a positive outlook because we're keeping our eyes on Jesus. Patience teaches us to endure because we believe God is in control of our circumstances. You know, Christians longing for the past usually are short-tempered and very critical. Victorian essayist Hilaire Bullock said, while you are dreaming of the future or regretting the past, the present, which is all you have, slips from you and is gone. How true. When life is difficult and we're impatient for change, it's easy to long for the good old days. Now, there's nothing wrong with the past. We learn from the past. We're grateful for the past. We've probably been blessed by the past. But we're to live in the present with all its opportunities. There was a Chinese woodcutter who lived a very humble life in China near the troubled Mongolian border. One day his favorite horse, a beautiful gray mare, jumped the fence and was captured. His friends tried to console him about this unfortunate development. But the man responded, it might be bad that it ran away or it might be good, we just don't know. A week later, his mare galloped back home beside a magnificent stallion. As he put both horses into his barns, his neighbors came to admire his good fortune. And he responded, it might be good that she returned with the stallion, but we just don't know. Well, the man's only son decided to ride the stallion. It bucked him off, breaking his leg. His friends came back sympathizing over the bad news. And so what Woodcutter responded, it might be bad news, but it might turn out to be good news after all. Well, war erupted between China and Mongolia, and all the able-bodied young men were forced into service. All perished, except for the Woodcutter's son, who couldn't serve because of his broken leg. So what appears to be bad news might bear good things, while the good can open up difficulty. Paul reminds us in Romans, we know God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Question, how are the challenges of life cultivating in you a, a Christ-like character today? You know, as we age, the older we get, we should be like a fine wine where the, the fruit of the Spirit are love for God and others, the joy and peace of Christ, his patience and self-control are maturing and growing and continuing to bear much fruit. And so we're, we're cultivating a, a Christ-like character in our life. And that's what the challenges and difficulties of like life do. They uh, allow us to be developed so we can shine for Jesus Christ in a dark and weary world. Then Solomon goes on to say, wisdom strengthens a wise person more than 10 rulers who are in a city. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ is the wisdom of God. And he has become our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So another way of saying is Jesus strengthens a wise person more than 10 rulers who are in a city. Again, that's saying it through new covenant eyes. The wise have the inner strength of a well-governed city. Wisdom governs our, our thought to think about things in a God-centered way. Wisdom governs the will to know what choices to make in life. Wisdom governs speech so we know what to say and what not to say. Wisdom governs actions to know what to do or not to do in each and every situation. And so Solomon kind of puzzled. He said, I've seen everything. There's a righteous person who perishes in his righteousness. There's a wicked person who prolongs his life and his w wickedness. 
So why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? That's a very good question, isn't it? At times it appears the darkness, the wicked, appear to prosper. That is only if you take the short view of things. It says in Psalm 73, Whom do I have in heaven but you? And with you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish, all those who are unfaithful to you. That, that's the, the long view of things. You know, there was a teacher who needed supplies from the Sunday school cupboard that was seldom used, but it was locked. And the teacher didn't know the combination, but the pastor offered to give it a try. So he places his fingers on the lock's dial, has raised his eyes heavenward for a moment. He confidently spun the dial and it opened the lock. Seeing how impressed the teacher was, he just simply smiled and said, oh, the numbers are written on the ceiling. Nothing like the inner strength and confidence when being in the loop is there. Well, we're strengthened by God's word, which reveals the final outcome of those who are not in the loop. Those who are in Christ, like Lazarus, will, will, will enjoy the, the blessing and wonders of heaven. Those who are not in Christ, like the rich man, will experience what it's like to be separated from God forever, where hell is a sign for the, the Satan and the wicked and all the, the evil angels. So Ta Solomon goes on to say, I tested everything with wisdom, and I said, I will be wise. Wisdom was far from me. What has been is remote and very mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know and to investigate and to seek wisdom and an explanation. Well, with all his God-given wisdom, he still could not understand how God manages all that exists. You know, God has so much for us, we can never discover the depths and riches of his grace and mercy, his character, and all who God is on this side of heaven. Now, Isaac Newton was a brilliant physicist of the 17th century. He solved the laws of motion and universal gravity by the age of 24. He invented calculus, discovered law of the tides. He was the first to discover light was composed of all the colors of the spectrum. For 200 years, his mathematical formulas controlled scientific thought. He was the first scientist to be knighted by the crown. Here's what Newton, a very committed Christian, wrote. I have only discovered the edges of God's ways. There's a great ocean of knowledge, and I have been paddling in the shallows. Wow. Only paddy, paddle, paddling in shallow water of this immense ocean of all there is to know about God and his creation and all who he is. Yet uh, wisdom draws inner strength when we're puzzled by the mysteries of life. No, we don't know everything there is to know, but the reason we can have the peace of God because he's revealed all that we need to know for eternal life and salvation. We, we have a, a little glimpse. We have a, a little... Uh, uh, spoonful of water in the big ocean of all who God is. Paul said, we do not lose heart, though our outer person is decaying, our inner person is being renewed day by day. Our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Things which are seen are 
temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, the best is yet to come. One day we're going to have a, a glorified body. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that feels like or senses like, but I know it's going to be awesome and great because God has revealed that to us in his word. Till then, the little bit that we do know, we're to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Being in Christ, the bottom line is, as he fills us up with his love, the, his character, which is love and forgiveness and mercy and peace, continues to flow from our lives. There was a uh, small child with a bad cough taken by her parents to a hospital emergency room. The doctor examined the child's lungs with a stethoscope. I got to see if Barney's in there. The child said, I have Jesus in my heart. Barney is on my underwear. Well, God continued to grant us childlike faith. As the people of God, we are indeed blessed by the wise advice that we have from the word of God. That's part one. We'll continue with part two next time. Let's close with that great chorus from Because He Lives. Actually, we'll, we'll do a, a, a verse of uh, Because He Lives because uh, it really uh, summarizes what it means to be in Christ. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love. He'll and forgive. He lived and died. Yes, we can face today, tomorrow, because he lives. We're not guided by fear. We know he's in control, that he holds the future. Life is indeed worth the living just because he lives. And because we have that truth in our hearts, we're, be, we're being renewed by that truth on the inside until Jesus calls us home and we'll get to experience the mansion that he is preparing for us. Well, continue to be encouraged by Jesus and his word, word till we meet again. Go in that peace. <laughs>